Well, good morning. I figure I can't top last Sunday, so we're just going to have some fun singing this morning our Christmas carols. Would you please stand and sing together the first Noel? of a Christmas. It took the cross to give us Jesus and to give us the promise of new birth and new life. So that's, a, we never sing those other verses very much, but that last one, you know, we talked about um, his blood mankind hath bought. We never sing those verses, but there's, there's a whole load of information and God's love in those words. So as we sing them, look at the words a little bit. All right, let's go on. Let's do it. Came upon a midnight clear. <clears throat>
angels sing? Amen. One day we will be in the presence of our Lord and the angels' voices will be heard and we'll be joining that heavenly choir. God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. Thank you, church. You may be seated. Well, amen. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Thank you, Miss Wanda, again, and Brother Martin, and choir. And in fact, the choir will be practicing right after the service today. And if you want to join the choir, today will be the day to do it. Getting ready for Christmas Sunday coming up, just a couple of Sundays away. But um, thank you today also singing out those wonderful Christmas hymns and Leslie always adding to it and the messages and listening to those words. Now I invite you to take your Bible and go with me to, again, the last book in your Bible, the book of Revelation, Revelation 19, as we continue our journey in a series that I've been calling What's in Store for the Future, taking a fresh look at the book of Revelation in light of what's all going on in our world today. And today... As we look at chapter 19, I'm going to call this message the very title that's given to Jesus that we see in verse 16, Jesus, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So let's read our text in Revelation 19, starting in verse 1, and we'll follow the reading of God's holy, inspired, and errant, infallible word with prayer. The Bible says, After these things, I, that's John now on the Isle of Patmos, heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. And he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Again they said, Alleluia. Her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. Then a voice came from the throne, saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of, many, of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, See, did you not worship? See, did you not do that? I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren you have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and that with it he should strike the nations." And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads with the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let us pray. God, our Father in heaven, Lord, I ask again for a fresh touch from the Holy Spirit. Lord, I need that fresh feeling to empower me to preach your word today with clarity of speech, with Holy Spirit power and conviction. And Father, we pray that I, that I will decrease, you increase. I want you to put your thoughts in my mind and your words in my mouth, O oh God. And Father, we want you to bind the devil and every demon spirit, Lord, that the only spirit that will be moving in this service will be the Holy Spirit. And that any decisions that need to be made today, Lord, will be made according to your call and conviction. So we just trust you for your will to be done. In Jesus' holy name, amen. amen. As you read through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, there is a unique rhythm to the main story in God's master plan of redemption for mankind. The entire Old Testament is pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ is woven through all the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. So through a series of prophecies and prophets and throughout the early centuries, Jesus Christ in the Old Testament is clearly pictured, proclaimed, and prophesied. When you come to the end of the Old Testament, through that final prophecy of the book of Malachi, at that moment, heaven goes silent for about 400 years. The years between the Old and New Testament are known as silent years because there was no scripture or no new revelation being given by God to anyone during that period of time. But then all of a sudden, the silence of God was broken as the angels appeared to the Virgin Mary and Joseph and then to the shepherds the night of the birth of Jesus. And then after the birth of Jesus, it goes quiet again. And it's quiet for about 12 years until we see the young boy Jesus in the temple, teaching the religious leaders, astonishing them with the way he's teaching. Jesus gives us a glimpse of the type of ministry that the Lord is going to have. And then it goes quiet again for about 18 years. The next time we see uh, the heaven open with, a, with, with, with words is that when Jesus, at the young age of 30 years old, is being baptized with John the Baptist. And he begins his earthly ministry of preaching and teaching and healing, performing many miracles and signs that point to the fact that Jesus Christ is truly the promised Messiah, the Son of the living God. So we know from the scripture that the public ministry of Jesus Christ on this earth that started right after his baptism culminated at his crucifixion where he died on the cross for all sins of the world all at one time. The dead body of Jesus was placed in a barred tomb and then again the world goes silent for three days. That silence was broken on day three because Jesus steps out gloriously from that grave, fully alive as he's resurrected from the dead. And he begins to minister and serve again on this earth for about 40 days after his resurrection in a risen, glorified body. And then he's taken back up to heaven. His disciples stand amazed in awe of his ascension. And once he passes past that final cloud out of sight, where he sits at the right hand of the Father, prophetically, it has gone silent again. Because the prophecy clock for the nation of Israel stopped on the day of Pentecost. Today, we're still in a church age. You and I, as a church, are continuing the work of the disciples, who were standing on that day, on that mountain, watching our Lord and Savior ascend back into heaven. Today we continue the work of the Great Commission to take the gospel to all four corners of the world, to reach the lost, to make disciples in our neighborhoods, in our nation, in surrounding nations, baptizing new converts in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, just proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ crucified but also resurrected. But prophetically speaking for Israel, it's been silent since the church age began. Daniel prophesied 70 weeks. 69 weeks have been completed. The 70th week is yet to be fulfilled. That will take care of the seven-year tribulation period that is still yet to happen. So the prophecy clock for Israel stopped and will not start again until after the rapture of the church. So that means, according to Scripture, the next prophetic sound that we're going to hear is the sound of a trumpet. The next trumpet is going to announce the arrival and the return of King Jesus first in the clouds to call his church home. And then seven years later, he'll return as King of Kings and Lord of Lords to set up his millennial reign on this earth. And here in Revelation 19, we see a beautiful picture painted by John here while he was on the Isle of Patmos to give us this vision of future event to come. The second coming of Jesus Christ when he comes back to this earth to set up his millennial reign is the, is the final piece of the story. The same Jesus born in Bethlehem's manger, the same one who lived a sinless life, the same one who died on Calvary's cross, buried in a barred tomb, risen the third day, ascended back to heaven, that same Jesus is coming back again. And the Bible says he could come back at any time. Just as the old hymn writer says, soon and very soon, we're going to see the king. So this chapter really describes the glorious moment of the second return of the king of kings and lord of lords. 
And so this passage, I want you to see three very important truths about the second coming of Jesus Christ. First of all, I want you to see that his return will be visible. It will be visible. Let me make this very clear. The return of Jesus Christ coming back to this earth is not fiction. It's not a fable. It's not a fairy tale. It is a historical fact. Bible prophecy that is still yet to be fulfilled is just really pre-written history. It's going to be fulfilled just as the Bible says. Just as sure as your yesterday was, Jesus Christ is coming back again at a time that only God knows, but he's coming back. This is not a story that we use to scare people to try to change their morality or their way of living. This is the truth that God himself delivered to us in his word under the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We know that Jesus Christ will be turning back visibly because the angels declared that truth to the disciples on that day when they watched Jesus ascend back into heaven. In Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 10, it says, While they look." Steadfastly toward heaven as he went up. Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Now we can only imagine what that scene must have looked like. But remember, Jesus had already told his disciples in advance that he was going to go back to heaven. And they got to see it happen. Those disciples were very, were very clearly told the same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come again just as you see him go. So how did he go? He went up literally. He went up bodily. And he went up visibly because they witnessed it. How is he going to return? Literally, bodily, and visibly. Some people say, do you really think Jesus is going to come back in the, the same way in the sky? I surely do, because the Bible says he went up into the sky, he ascended that way, and the same Jesus is coming back in the same way. I have no reason not to believe that. Yeah. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7 says, Behold, he's coming with clouds, and every eye will see him. So I don't see how much, that's not too hard to figure out. That's pretty clear. So that tells us that the second coming of Jesus Christ to this earth is not going to be a secret. It's not going to be something done in the shadows. The Bible is very clear. Jesus is coming back again visibly. When he comes the second time, the whole world will know that he has arrived. I love the gospel song that says, I didn't see him go up, but I'll see him when he comes down. I'll say hallelujah with that. Well, we as Bible students have a strong belief about the order of these end time events. We believe in a pre-tribulation rapture or the catching away of the church before the tribulation period takes place. Revelation chapter 4 gives us a picture of the rapture when Jesus has come up here. Revelation 5 shows us the church worshiping God in heaven. And so part of our understanding of believing that the rapture will come first is what we see here in chapter 19. And verse 14 of this chapter is talking about the end of the tribulation period. Now remember, chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation pictures the church age. That's the age that we live in now. Chapters 4 and 5 pictures the church in heaven. Chapters 6 through 19 pictures the great tribulation period. You don't see the church mentioned there because the church is in heaven with the Lord. The tribulation period takes place on this earth. So the tribulation period follows the rapture all the way to the second coming of Christ, when Christ comes back with his church. Notice verse 14. And the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. So who are these that make up the armies of heaven? These are the saved saints. These that make up the body of Christ, the church, the bride of Christ. That means us, those of us who have been truly saved. That's why we believe in a pre-trib rapture, a catching away of the church before the great tribulation period begins. Because if we, the bride of Christ, are going to return with him at the end of the tribulation period, then that has to mean he's going to come get us first before the tribulation begins. And so at the rapture, Jesus comes for his church. That's where we meet the Lord in the air. He doesn't touch the earth at that time. We meet him in the air. At the second coming, when he comes back with his church, 
He comes along to land on this earth to set up his millennial reign. Jesus told us to watch for this to happen. Jesus was the greatest prophecy teacher of all times. He clearly predicted his second coming. In fact, listen to the words of Jesus in Matthew 24. Starting in verse 24, I mean, verse 37, Jesus said, As the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Now that right there, that story is a picture of salvation where Noah and his family were saved and safe from God's wrath of judgment. It was coming because they were inside the ark. Remember, the flood came and took all those outside the ark away. The only ones that were saved were Noah and his family. They had found grace in the eyes of the Lord. They were saved, safe, and secure inside the ark, which is a clear picture of salvation in Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 24, starting in verse 40, Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. That is a reference to the coming rapture, where there will be no signs. There will be no warnings in advance. The rapture will take place in a moment. In a twinkling of an eye, that's faster than a blink. And Jesus is basically teaching us not to be looking for the great tribulation period that's coming. He's talking to us to look for the Lord who's coming before the tribulation period begins. That's good news. Because you and I who make up the true church, if we were intended to go through the tribulation period, Jesus would not have told us to be looking for a soon appearing. He would have told us to be watch out for the appearing of the coming Antichrist. But we, the church, the bride of Christ, we're not looking for the Antichrist because we know the real Christ. And we know that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, will personally come and rescue us before the Antichrist appears. And that's good news. 1 Thessalonians 5, beginning with verse 9, all the way through verse 11, teaches us that the, the great tribulation period is the great day of God's wrath on the earth. But the Bible also teaches that we believers who are saved, we are saved from the wrath of God that's coming. Now, we do know God will chastise and he will discipline his church for disobedience. God does teach us that judgment begins with the house of the Lord. We see that very clearly in Revelation 2 and 3 when Jesus addressed seven specific churches and five of the seven, Jesus had some concerns and he had to tell each of those five churches they needed to repent. So the Lord, yes, he will bring correction and chastisement to those he loves, just as a loving parent will uh, chastise or discipline their child that, to lovingly correct them, not to hurt them, but to help them. Well, our Lord and our Savior is not going to pour out judgment wrath upon the church. The wrath of God is reserved for those who are unsaved. It's reserved for lost sinners, those who reject Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus told the church at Philadelphia in Revelation 3.10, because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is coming to the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. In other words, those who are left behind, the inhabitants of the earth, those that are not caught up to meet the Lord. That refers to those who do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior those who choose to live in sin, those who choose to walk in evil, those that will be left behind to face the judgment wrath of God. The Lord says to his church, you're not going to experience what they will experience. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 says, Jesus delivers us, speaking of the church, from the wrath to come. I don't know how much more clear it can be. So what that means is that the wrath of God's judgment is reserved for sin, evil, and all those who are unsaved. Jesus said to the church at Philadelphia, and what he said to them, he's saying to us today, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Remember, all throughout the Scripture, God protects his own people before he sends his judgment wrath. God took Lot. Lot was a backslidden Christian. You wouldn't even known he was a Christian if we hadn't been told in the Word of God. He didn't live a good Christian life. But God took him out of Sodom before the fire and brimstone fell. God put Noah and his family inside that ark 
before the flood came. So the pattern of Scripture is pretty clear to me that we believe that before the great tribulation is poured out on this world, the bride of Christ, the church, will be taken out, raptured, caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Now, I do know there are some Christians who don't believe in pre-trib rapture. There are some who they, they take scriptures and how they come up with the way to do, but they do. There are some to believe in mid-trib rapture. They think we're going to go through half of the tribulation. Some think we're going to be post-trib. They think it's going to be after the tribulation. They actually think we're going to go through the tribulation period. Well, I understand Christians can uh, disagree in this area and still mainstream things of fellowship because if you want to believe that or not, it doesn't have nothing to do with your salvation. It's just a misunderstanding of Scripture. But I, I, like I've told my Christian friends before who think we're going through the tribulation period, I'm not. If you want to go through it, you can go ahead. I believe without a shadow of a doubt, with 100% that the church, the Bible, teaches pre-trib rapture. But regardless... There's an orthodox understanding that any gospel believer in this room or anywhere can believe in. And that's the fact, regardless of what if you want to believe pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib, the fact is Jesus is coming again. And the Bible teaches we're supposed to be watching and ready for a soon return. All the timeline charts, regardless of what view someone takes, shows the return of Jesus Christ to this earth. The setup of his millennial reign takes place after the seven-year tribulation period. The Bible is clear. The rider on the white horse will appear visibly first in the sky. And before he lands on planet Earth, I want to tell you, the second coming, before he even lands, I want you to know the battle has already been won. Because in this scripture, not only do we see the return of Jesus going to be visible, but number two, it's going to be victorious. I mean victorious. Look at the imagery of victory we see in verses 11, 12, and 13. There's a couple of highlights I want to bring to your attention here that John talks about the return of Jesus Christ. First, we see his conquest. Verse 11 says, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And on this white horse, the Bible says, is the one and only who's called faithful and true. Now, remember when Jesus entered into Jerusalem the first time, according to John's gospel, he came riding in on a donkey. That was fulfillment to Bible prophecy. When he enters Jerusalem the second time, he'll be riding on a white stallion in fulfillment to Bible prophecy. The first time he came, he came as a dying, uh, basically a suffering servant to die on a cross. But the second time he comes, he's coming as the conquering king to vanquish all evil once and for all. The Bible says he'll be accompanied by this great army. Not only would that include the angels, but that's going to include his bride, the church. That means those of us who are saved, we're going to be part of this. But I want you to notice something that's very interesting about this army of heaven that comes back with Jesus. This is what I love. Because you don't see one person in this army who comes back with Jesus lift a finger or fire a shot. Notice verse 15. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. Notice those of us who are coming back with Jesus, we don't have to fight the enemy because the Lord himself defeats his foes unassisted. We're basically just riding along. We're just there to witness this victorious return of King Jesus as he and he alone will take out his enemies once and for all. The good news is we will not have to lift a finger, strike a blow, fire a shot. Everything that needs to be done will be done by King Jesus and him alone. Because Jesus is the one and only conquering king of all kings. So not only do we see a picture of his conquest, we see a picture of his character. Notice again in verse 11. Jesus riding on his right horse is called faithful and true in righteousness. He judges and makes war. That gives perfect descriptions of the character of the victorious King Jesus because he truly is the righteous king. He's the faithful king. He's the true king of all kings. The Bible says in verse 12, he had a name written that no one knew except himself. Someone said, well, I wonder what that name is. Well, we don't know. And we won't know until it's revealed. That's a secret that belongs to God. There are mysteries about God and the Lord Jesus Christ that we can't even fathom in our limited human minds on this side of heaven. He is the highest of the high. His omnipotence, his omniscience, his omnipresence is really beyond our limited human, human comprehension. And that's the beauty 
of the season of Christmas every year that we celebrate. The fact that God himself, the unlimited, all-powerful God, condescended. He, he, he took on human flesh to become like us. He was 100% God and 100% man. Lived a sinless life. Stepped out on the scene right after his baptism to perform miracles and preaching and teaching. And then dying that sacrificial, substitutionary, blood-atoning death that conquered victory over death, hell, and the grave because he rose from the dead to live again. He ascended back to heaven. And this same God who sent his only begotten son to this world to do that so that you and I could have a personal relationship with Jesus. Be guaranteed heaven. That is a miracle beyond what you and I could ever hope for or dreamed of in our limited minds and abilities. For God's plan of redemption is not a plan that any of us would have ever made, but it's always been his plan from the very beginning. And what I love about the description, about the character of the victorious Lord and Savior is the fact Jesus is righteous, he is faithful, he is true. That's why we can always trust him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength every single day because he and he alone is totally trustworthy. Now, you know, we definitely need leaders like that in our nation today. And you know, today it's hard to know who you can trust. But I can tell you this, you can always trust Jesus because only Jesus is perfectly righteous Perfectly faithful and perfectly true. And here he's coming back in victory. We see a clear picture of not only his conquest and his character, but also his crown. Notice in verse 12, his eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. Many crowns or many diadems. That word diadem is the word used for a regal crown. It was a crown that only a king would wear. But notice King Jesus is not just wearing one crown. He wears many crowns because he is the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords, so he wears all the crowns. Notice the first time he came, he wore a crown fashioned by his own creation, placed on his head by his own creation, so that he could die for those that he created. But the next time he comes, he will wear a crown not fashioned by human hands, this crown of many crowns has been fashioned and formed in heaven, made of the purest gold. It's been placed on his head because when he comes back the second time, he's not coming back to get crowned. He's coming back already crowned because he already reigns as king of kings and lord of lords. And he's coming back to establish a kingdom that's already his. But also in this passage, we see a picture of his cross. His cross, notice verse 13. You can miss this if you're not careful. He was clothed in a robe dipped in blood. This is a mark of honor. You know, he, he's the five-star general of God's army. The Lord Jesus Christ bears on his robe a reminder of the sacrifice and service in the greatest war that's ever been waged. Because at Calvary, a battle was fought. And it was there he shed his blood. And that blood stain on his robe is there for all eternity as a reminder of the battle that was fought and won at the cross. The victory has been secured because the sacrifice has been made and paid for in full so that whoever will place their faith and trust in Jesus can be saved. No one will ever strip Jesus of the medal of honor. No one will ever strip him of that reminder. No one will ever undermine him or disqualify him. For all eternity, he'll bear the marks of the cross. Think about it. He'll be the only one in heaven that has scars. You and I won't, but he will. And he'll be the only one that has a robe, that has a blood stain. Reminding us of the ultimate sacrifice. Reminding us that the price for sin, for our salvation, was paid for in full by his blood at Calvary which tells us that it's the blood of Jesus that gives us the total victory. Apart from the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. You know, there's many situations where the shedding of blood can be as a symbol of defeat or loss. But for Jesus, the shedding of his blood was for victory and strength. You know, our world today is desperate for hope. And we Christians, we know where to find it. It's not in science. It's not in education. It's not in politics. Even though I'm thankful for all those who are willing to serve our nation, our state, and our county. But let me tell you something. The best politician in the world will tell you they're not the answer for the world's problems. 
The answer is Jesus. Because true hope has a name. His name is Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. So therefore, his soon return, according to God's word, will be visible. It will be victorious. But this is what you really need to understand on this second return of Jesus. Number three, his return will bring vengeance. Will bring vengeance. Notice verse 15. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it should strike the nations. He himself will rule with a rod of iron. Now listen to this. He treads... He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. The fierceness and wrath. You see, the Bible teaches us that God is a holy God. He's holy and without sin. Yes, he's a God of love, but he's also a God of wrath. He's a God of judgment. God is too good and holy not to punish sin. There are people today who are atheists and agnostics and they're just skeptical of what you and I as Christians believe about God and creation. And they say, well, why would you want to believe in a God that allows all this evil to go on this earth? Well, we know right now as Christians, God's given everybody free will to choose. There's a right way and there's a wrong way. But there's coming a day when all evil will be judged once and for all. The Bible's clear about that. There's nobody going to get by with evil. They may get by on this earth a little while, but they're not going to get by with it forever. God is holy, and he must judge all sin. And when he judges, he's completely just. That means when he judges sin, he will judge it justly. He's going to wipe the slate entire clean. He's going to right every wrong, and he's going to judge in righteousness, just as the Bible says. But right now, in his grace, in his long-suffering, tarrying his coming... That's good news right now for anybody who's still lost. Because I want to tell you right now, if God was choose to judge all sin right now, if you've not been saved, that means you're still dead in your sin. That means you would have to be judged. And that means you would be doomed. The only hope you have right now is the tearing of the return of Christ. The grace that God extends to you by offering you this chance right now today Offering you another minute, another hour, another day, another week, which none of us are guaranteed that we may have. However long tarries his coming, that's just God giving you grace and mercy and not justice. God is a God of infinite love, mercy, and grace. And we see that unconditional sacrificial love displayed in that robe of white that he wears stained with blood. But he's a God of wrath and his judgment wrath is coming. Now, right now, we have to preach both that God is love and God is just. You have to understand that if we just preach God's love without his wrath, that's an incomplete gospel. That's not giving people the total story. If we just preach about his wrath and judgment, not about his love, that's also an incomplete gospel. There's bad news and there's good news. You need both so that you can make a good choice in order to choose the right way. The truth this morning that I really want you to understand is you can have as much as God as you want. When God, when God saves you, he saves all of you. But the question is, have you given your total life to him? Listen, if you want grace and mercy, which I hope you do, you can have it in an endless supply. There's a never-ending fountain of mercy and grace that's offered to you only in Christ Jesus. There's no man, there's no woman, there's no religion that can give that to you. If you're lost and separated from God and you want to be saved, listen, you could be saved today and your life can be changed forever. But listen, if you refuse the call of Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, if you resist his conviction, you run away from his call, please understand there's coming a day where you have to face his wrath. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 8 says, Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance, listen to this, on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. One of these days, everybody, you're going to stand before God and you're either going to stand on your own record or you're going to stand on the record of Jesus. You're either going to stand in your own self-righteousness or you're going to be seen with the righteousness of Christ because you've been covered by his blood. 
And I'm telling you, love, there's not a person in this room that can ever be good enough to stand on their own record. We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And apart from righteousness of Christ imputed to us, we don't have any. Now you may say, well, pastor, I don't understand how all this evil can go on. It just seems like every night on the news there's another shooting, there's another act of violence. How all these folks can seem to go unpunished. Why don't God seem to do something about it now? Well, you just need to understand it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. See, the devout atheists, they say there is no God. Anybody who don't believe in a God really don't have hope for justice. Because if there's no God, if there's no creator, who are you going to give an account to? I mean, that just don't even make no sense. We believe there is a God. And we believe he's coming back. And when he comes back, verse 15, he's going to strike down the nations. He's going to rule with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Church, Jesus Christ is coming back again. And he's coming with vengeance to destroy all the works of the devil. He will make all things right. So in spite of the times when it looks like sometimes evil has won, Sometimes when it looks like there's no justice, just remember there's coming a day when the righteous judge, King Jesus, is coming again and he will right every wrong. So you say, well, what do I do with that? What does that mean for me right now on this day, Sunday, December 4th, 2022? It means that Jesus is going to come. He's going to come visibly. He's going to come victoriously. And when he comes the second time, he's going to bring vengeance. So what do you and I do with that information? Well, as a born-again believer, if you already know Christ, there's a couple of things you ought to do with it. First, we ought to be looking for His coming at any moment. I want you to understand that we're not waiting for one more prophecy to be fulfilled before the rapture of the church can take place. The rapture of the church is imminent. It can happen at any moment, at any time, with no warning. So we're not waiting for something to happen. We're waiting for someone to come. And the good news is, the good news of the gospel is that that's the hope that we have as believers that any day, any moment, Jesus could come to rescue his church off this earth. It will happen just like that in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. We're supposed to be looking for that. But while we're looking for that, we need to keep the other eye on earth. Because not only should we be looking for his coming, we ought to be living for his coming. We should live every day as if the day could be the day that Jesus could come. Our desirous Christians really ought to be, as we wait for his soon return, that we will be faithful serving him until he comes. This is not a call for us to go sit on the field or go hide on top of a mountain and just hope and wait for Jesus to come. Oh, no. One eye on the future and one eye on the prize, we should wake up every day. And we, as members of the body of Christ, every day the Lord gives us, every moment, every breath He gives us to breathe the breath of life is another opportunity to continue the mission and purpose to fulfill that He's given us for His glory as we spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. That means in the meantime, until Jesus comes, we should be sharing, we should be serving, we should be loving, we should be giving, we should do everything we can do in our, in our abilities to be the hands and feet of Jesus, getting the gospel out to our neighbors, to the nations of the world. We do that not only if you're not able to go through mission giving, even right now, the Lottie Moon, that's the international missions. We certainly don't want to be found doing nothing when Jesus comes, we don't work to get saved, but the, the saving faith that saves us will produce good works. We should not want to be caught by surprise when Jesus comes. We certainly don't want to be caught doing something we shouldn't be doing. I don't want to be any place where I shouldn't be. I don't want to be caught doing what I should not be doing. I just want the Lord, when he comes, to find me watchful, ready, and faithful. When that trumpet sounds, I certainly don't want to be spiritually asleep. And I certainly don't want to be found living in sin. I want to be found faithfully serving the Lord. So when he comes, 
he can say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Not because I deserve that kind of compliment, because I don't. But I know that Jesus Christ gave his best for me on the cross. The least I can do is to give my best to him by being faithful to the call of God on my life as long as he gives me the breath of life to breathe. Because he is worthy of that. He shed his blood. He gave his life. He saved my soul. And every person in here who has been saved, you've been purchased by the blood of Jesus. You should wake up every day with a driving force and passion saying, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. How can I live my life today for the glory and honor of God for the purpose that he has put before me? So here's the truth. King Jesus is coming again. And he's coming soon. But here's the big question. Are you ready? Because when you see Jesus, and every eye will see him one day, when you see Jesus, will you see him as your Savior and Lord and be saved from the wrath to come? Or will you see Jesus as your judge and have to experience the wrath to come? That choice is yours. I pray you'll make the right choice. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, in Jesus' name, oh, Holy Spirit, we do thank you for the Revelation teaching, Lord. You tell us it's a guaranteed blessing for those who hear or read that prophecy. And Lord, we know we're getting to the end of the Revelation, Lord, where we can see, Lord, what you have in store for us in the glory of heaven. But Lord, we also have seen what the tribulation years is going to be on this earth through the various judgments that are coming. But Lord, right now we're in the church age. You have, you have guaranteed we'll be saved from the wrath that's coming. But Lord, we know there's so many, not only in our families, our neighborhoods, people we know and work with, Lord, that don't know you as Lord and Savior. Oh God, help us to shine a light bright for you and win many more before it's too late to your kingdom. Any decision that needs to be made in this service today, I pray to be done without hesitation or reservation. But just follow your conviction and call. And we trust you for your results. In Jesus' name.